Well, let's flip to Philippians chapter 3. And I love to say that. This morning we're going to continue with our series called Living in Heavenly Joy. We began this eight-part message series on April the 7th. I think that was the Sunday after Easter. And it was, it's been a journey because I've hit it whenever I could and other people have come in and spoke, spoke. But each, each lesson is really a standalone lesson. So even if you haven't been here for all of it, you can learn something today that will strengthen you in your walk with the Lord. But we do have it on our social media platforms as well as on our app where you can go back and what, listen to some of these or watch them. Uh, uh, on when you have time, because I believe it'll strengthen you and, and build something in you that needs to, to get stronger. Amen? Amen? In this short book that has only four chapters, uh, it's, it's powerful, but every chapter is packed with wisdom for living in heavenly joy. And the words joy and rejoice occur 18 times in this beautiful letter written by the Apostle Paul to encourage his friends in Philippi. And so Paul had a great connection to this church that he established, and it went deep to the core of his being. I get this because this is a church that God called us to establish here. And my love for you and my concern for your spiritual growth goes deep to my core. I truly care that, that about how you mature in the Word of God. Uh, and I was talking on Wednesday night how it's so important that we learn to self-feed. And how, you know, there was a time when my mama brought everything to me. I mean, every bit of food came to me because my mama fixed it. But there were times when mama wasn't around and I had to look around for something to eat. I had to learn to fry my own egg. I remember when, uh, I, when I couldn't even hit the stoves, I remember I, there was bread in the house. So I went and got bread and I found sugar and I rolled it up made a sugar sandwich. I don't know if anybody's ever done that. But if you're hungry enough, you're going to find something to eat. And we need to get hungry for the Word of God and realize that the Holy Spirit will give us exactly what we need, something that will sustain us and help us. And this is why this church is here, because you need more than a sugar sandwich. Every now and then you need some meat and potatoes. Hey, man, how about a big T-bone steak with, and a baked potato with all the trimmings? And don't forget about dessert. Dessert is important, Amen. Hallelujah. So it's important to realize that God wants you to grow up as a believer, and at some point you got to start feeding yourself because you're going to get a lot of nutrition every time someone comes into this pulpit. We, don't, we only have the best here. And even when Jesse and I are out of town, God has seasoned men and women of God who are, who are part of this church that can step into this pulpit and proclaim the Word of God and minister to the congregation. I'm thankful to God for that. Aren't you? Yeah. So it's important to realize that you need to be a self-feeder as well. So whatever you get here at the church is great, but that's gonna, that should stir you up to want more so that you can get before the Lord, study the Word of God yourself, read it throughout the week as you have time to. Some days you'll have more time than others. And the Holy Spirit will drop nuggets within you that will carry you on to that next situation. Amen. Prepare you exactly for what you're about to face. Give the Lord a shout and a praise in the house. That is so true. So uh, Paul wrote this letter from the Roman prison to tell them how much he loved them and how he prayed for them. We, I'm just going to do a really quick review uh, in case some of you are new to this study. Part one was titled Praying with Joy. And we saw that God will give you a divine partnership with those that he places in your heart which will empower you to make requests for them with joy. God puts things on my heart to pray for you. We have the pastoral team who's continually connected with the needs of the congregation as we hear about it, and we share it with one another, and we pray for each other, and then we get testimonies of how God miraculously moved. We know the power of prayer. We know that where two or more agree is touching anything, it's done by our Father which is in heaven. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. So we, we kind of can relate to Paul. I know the pastoral team can, can attest to that and agree with me on that. So we talked about praying with joy. So he didn't just pray and moan and groan. He, he had a joyful attitude when he prayed. And he was praying, even though he was from prison, he knew that they were encountering some things because he faced some things and he was in prison because of it. When you make a stand for Christ, some, there are consequences sometimes, especially in that day and time when they were living in. Part two was making a choice to rejoice. And I told you that when you make a choice to rejoice, God can turn opposition into an opportunity to advance your vision. 
Paul rejoiced because he right there, because he was in prison, he was able to preach to the household of Caesar. He said, the saints in Caesar's house say hello. So apparently he had won some of them to the Lord. And he was, they were shackled, uh, uh, soldiers were shackled to him. So they had no choice but to hear everything that Paul had to say. And I'm telling you, he was making an impact on that whole palace. So he made a choice to rejoice and his opportunity, his Opposition was actually an, uh, an opportunity. Amen? Part three, we talked about developing a mindset of joy. You see, you can begin to develop a mindset of joy by meditating on each letter of the word joy, J-O-Y, Jesus, others, and you. We talked about that and a whole lot of other things that week in part three. Now, part four was serving with joy. And uh, serving with joy, I told you, revives, refreshes, replenishes, regenerates, and reharmonizes your life. Amen. Serving is the best kept secret, I'm telling you what. Being a servant, a true servant of the Lord, serving him wherever he calls you to has many, many, many rewards. Amen. And so you do it with joy, not begrudgingly, but it's, an, it's, a, it's a, you get to serve. But you have to, you get to. Amen. Amen. And then in part five uh, of this message in this book of Philippians, we studied the first part of chapter 3, which was pressing toward joy. And before we go on to the last part of chapter 3, I want to I want to read the last two verses from what we read in, that, in the service that was the last time I talked on this lesson, on this series, was May the 5th. So it's been a month since I've been in the pulpit on Sunday morning, so I'm so excited to be back teaching on this. But this was uh, one of Paul's most memorable Statements, And I think it's important that we read this again because it really connects to the, port, the last portion of the chapter 3 that we're going to be studying today. Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. It's going to be familiar to so many of you. It says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord. You see, when Paul, the Apostle Paul wrote these words from prison, he had achieved more for Christ than anyone in his generation. Yet he still wanted to know Christ. He still kept pressing forward to know more about him, that I might know him, he said, in a deeper way. So he had done more than anyone in his whole generation. He had preached all around the Mediterranean Sea. He preached in the imperial palace there in Rome. He started churches all over Asia Minor. And he had written most of the New Testament that we have today. See, this is what Paul could look back on, but he didn't rest on that. He had a holy discontent that kept him pressing toward joy. And he said he was forgetting the things that were behind him and reaching to far those things that were still before. God still had something else for him to do. So he got out of that prison. And he, he did some more things for God. And then, of course, we know he went back in prison. That's when he said, I'm ready. But he wasn't ready when he was in this, kind of, this prison. But God had, had, had something else for him to do. Later on, we know he did go to prison when he wrote to Timothy. And that was the last letter that he wrote was 2 Timothy. And he says, I'm ready to be offered. I, I've fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. Right? Amen. And so you can, he determined his time to go. He was ready. Hallelujah. He, many often he said in other scriptures, he says, I would rather be in heaven, but it's for your sake that I'm here. Yes. So he had an understanding of the reality of heaven and his eternal uh, promise. Amen. So Paul uh, was not affected by the prison chains that was on him. He kept pursuing God. His goal was to know Christ and to be like Christ and to be all that Christ and do all that Christ had in mind for him to do. And he wasn't leaving, wasn't letting the devil take him out until he was finished doing everything that God had called him to do. You know, you can leave early. You can choose to just go early, you could just give up, or you can stick it out and do what God has called you to do and be an influence, be a reproach against sin, and stand for the gospel, amen? That's what we're determined to do. We're, we want to stay here till Jesus comes back. And, and be busy right on the front lines doing everything he's called us to do. And he gives us supernatural strength and energy to step out and do all that we're called to do. Amen. Amen. Now let's begin part six. The title of this one is called 
walking in joy. Philippians chapter 3, we begin reading in verse 15. We're going to read 15, 16, and 17 together. It says, let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded, and if anything ye, ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be you followers together of me, and mark them which walk so, as you have for us an example. Praise the Lord. Point number one, they'll put them on the screens for you. Point number one, walking in joy is more than an outward demonstration. It is an inward mindset to be a passionate follower of Jesus Christ. Amen? I'm going to read that again. Walking in joy is more than an outward demonstration. You're not putting on a show. It is an inward mindset that, uh, to be a passionate follower of Jesus. It's, it's a, joy is the strength of the Lord within you. It's a force. It's not happiness, although happiness is wonderful, and you can have a smile on your face even when the enemy is attacking because you know the end result. You know that God's got a plan for your victory. Amen? Amen. So that's what's important. And, and this is and you're, because why they were following Paul's example. Has anybody ever played follow the leader in here? As a kid, I'm talking about follow the leader doesn't just mean walking behind them and looking at them. It means doing whatever they do. If they jump, you jump. If, if, you, uh, if they raise your, their hands, you raise your hands, right? If you play the game right, if you want to stay in the game, you got to do exactly what the leader does. Well, we follow Jesus, and we do exactly what he tells us to do. We follow him. If he tells us you walk in love, he tells us you lay hands on the sick, if he tells us you sow that seed, you do exactly what he tells you to do. If he tells you that you pray for someone that's sick and, and, uh, and oppressed of the enemy and, and set them free, you do that. Amen? So this is what we do. We follow our leader. In Paul's day, being a follower was a big deal. The Greek word translated followers meant imitators, mimic the gait, the speech, the accent, and the manner of life of another. So it's not just listening and watching them to say that you follow. Because we know in, the, in this culture of social media, a lot of us can be followers of Jesse Duplantis Ministries. Maybe you see some of the posts, but that doesn't mean you do everything that you see, that you learn. But we, 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 we have a lot of followers out there. Sometimes we, I'm a follower of people. I'm a friend of people, but I don't follow them because I don't have time to put so many, you know, just I'm selective about the few followers that I follow. Most of it's the ministry so they can monitor everything. But um, you can get a whole lot of followers together. That mean, doesn't mean you believe the same thing. doesn't mean you imitate what they believe. Amen. But in Paul's day, being a follower was a big deal. And it meant to, in this passage of Scripture, it meant to imitate God as children do their parents. They imitate his acts, his words, his nature, his ways, his graces, and his spirit. This is God we're talking about right now. See, Paul challenged the Philippians to be followers of him. And in verse 12, he admitted that he wasn't perfect. Just because you're following someone doesn't say that you say, oh, yeah, that person's perfect. Everything they do is exactly right. No, what Paul was saying is that he focused his life on walking like Christ, and so should they. they. They should imitate his passion to know God, to know more about God, to know God's plan for their lives. Amen? See, Paul used the term perfect to mean mature or complete, not flawless in every detail. None of us are perfect in that way. Only Jesus was perfect, amen, and is perfect. See, those who are mature should press on in the Holy Spirit's power, knowing that Christ will reveal and fill any discrepancy between what we are and what we should be. The Holy Ghost is still teaching. He's still leading. He's still guiding. Amen? And when you give him your life, he is all, you're always a work in progress. I often have said it this way, pardon my dust. I know I'm a work in progress. And uh, sometimes I leave a little dust here and there. But we have to, and we have to be merciful towards each other because all of us leave a little dust here and there when we're walking out our salvation with fear and trembling. Amen? God is a good God. So, Paul, uh, we have to remember that the Gospels were not yet in circulation, so Paul could not tell them to go and read the Bible and see what Christ was like. 
They knew what Christ was like because Paul had encountered Christ on the Damascus Road who was going one way, and all of a sudden he turned and went another way. And they could know that this man had a reputation that when he did something, he did it 100%. So he was 100% going after the Christian churches to haul them into prison. And then once he met Jesus, he turned around and went another way, but he still went that way with 100% of his passion and his, his uh, uh, tenacity to get done what God was calling him to do. Amen? And so he wanted them to follow him in that way. And we all need somebody to look to that we can follow that's following Jesus with all their heart and all their mind and all their soul. Amen? It inspires us to realize, well, you know, if they can do it, I can do it too. I know the enemy's attacking them, but look at them. They're still standing. The enemy does attack, but when you stand strong, I'm telling you what, your adversity will make you king. Attacks come, but when you stand strong and put your heels in and don't give up, you give glory to God and you walk forward and you receive your promise. Give the Lord a shout. Hallelujah. See, that's why he was urging them to imitate him. It wasn't about him. It's because he knew he was sold out to God and he wanted them to understand that the only way to live as an overcomer in this life is to live that way for God. Because the enemy has no new tactics. He's still always going around trying to steal, kill, and to destroy. And, but God wants us to know today that Jesus came with a better plan. Say, Jesus has a better plan for my life. He came to give us life and that more abundantly. He says, to the full, till it overflows. That's a great life. Hallelujah. So that's what Paul was urging them. He, he could tell these believers to follow his example because he had a testimony. You have to have a testimony. Sometimes you can't have a testimony until you have a test. But when you pass the test, you get demony. <laughs> that's a... You get anything, whatever it is that test is, you stand strong, you get your healing, you get your deliverance, you get your peace, amen? The test does come, but you are well able to defeat the devil and stand strong and believe God and receive everything that he wants you to have, amen? Hallelujah, give the Lord a shout. I'm excited tonight, this morning, whatever time it is. Let's turn to, back to Philippians chap, well, to chapter 2. It's just a page over to some of you. It may be even on the same page for some of you. Philippians chapter 2, verse 19. See, Paul also encouraged the Philippians to follow other godly examples, such as Timothy. They could see how Timothy walked because he sent Timothy to them and see how he lived his life in service to Christ. Philippians chapter 2, verse 19 and 20 we studied about it in a previous lesson a little bit. We read it. We didn't really center in on it a whole lot. But he says, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly to you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. See, Timothy was one of a kind. He shared the same love for the Lord and the love for the church that Paul did. And he said that there was no one else that was like-minded like Timothy to him. And every, everyone else that he knew apparently had a personal agenda or a wrong motive. But Timothy was a godly example that, that, that they could follow. And so often there are people who attach themselves to our ministry with the wrong motive. Some are there for a season, some are there for a long time. Not everybody, but there are. There, I look back and I see the few that have that have done that unwisely, and they've attached for a while for the wrong motive, and then they've gone on. and And some of them, it's like a debris field. They've they have a lot of devastation in their life. Some of them are walking towards that. But I'm not saying that they have to always be with us. But you leave in the right way. Y'all have seen it many times where we prayed a blessing and sent people on in the right way, but there's a right way and a wrong way. So apparently there were people that connected themselves to, to Paul or actually they imitated him. They actually forged his name and pretended to be him. And uh, we all know about uh, identity theft around here uh, in this day and age. So that was going on, but in a different way back then. But, so, but Paul could point to Timothy as a good example. He could point to himself as a good example because he knew he was committed to Jesus and he knew Timothy was as well. He was raising him up. He called, they called him his son in the Lord. 
Amen? Let's turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. When Paul established this church in Thessalonica, it was the largest city in Macedonia with a population of about 200,000 people. He went there during his second missionary journey after leaving Philippi, which is the book we're studying today, which was a much smaller city of about 100 miles away with a population of only 10,000 people. But here it is, Paul is writing also to First Thessalonians, to the Thessalonians, and I want us to read the testimony of an entire church that were examples to other believers. You know, I believe there are so many people in this church that are examples to other places, and when they leave, they leave with, the, with, with what has been deposited in them, and they leave stronger, and they bring the gospel, and they bring what they've learned other places as well. Amen? 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1, just read verse 6 and 7 with me. It says, And you became followers of us, and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that you were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. See, this entire church was examples of what it meant to follow Jesus. Paul said that they had much affliction, which meant that they suffered persecution for following Christ. But that did not stop them from walking in joy and being an example to all the other believers. Point number two, are y'all ready to write this down? Point number two, every follower of the Lord has a responsibility to rejoice and fill the earth with the joy of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. That's your responsibility. Fill the earth with the joy of the Holy Ghost. That's what the people did there in Thessalonica. They knew what it was to, to suffer persecution and have problems, but that didn't stop them. They kept following the joy of the Lord. And they not only did that, but the Bible talks, Paul talks about in Philippi, in the book of Philippians, how the church at Macedonia sent them uh, donations as well. So there are so many people that were, the, actually of all of the Macedonians there, the church, he was thanking the church at Philippi for being a blessing and those at, at Thessalonica as well knew what it was to, to be a support to the ministry then too. So every follower of the Lord has a responsibility to rejoice and fill the earth with the joy of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let's turn to Habakkuk chapter 3. That's the Old Testament. Habakkuk chapter 3. Habakkuk is a very small book of the Old Testament. It's before Zephaniah and Haggai. It's then it's Zechariah. And it's really close to the end of the Old Testament. And Habakkuk was a prophet... We know that from verse chapter 1, verse 1. But otherwise, nothing else is known about this, this prophet. And most of the prophets spoke to the people on behalf of God, but Habakkuk spoke to God on behalf of the people. He asked God questions about the difficulties that his nation was going through, and he learned to walk in joy. Uh, he learned the, how to trust in God and how to walk in joy. Let's read Habakkuk chapter 3. Just going to read three verses in this beautiful chapter. This is his re response after seeking God and searching God about what was going on. And we can learn some lessons from him today. Verse 17 says, Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall the fruit be in the vines, the labor of the olive shall fail, and the fields shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. That's a difficult time. He's painting a, diff a bad picture there of what's going on. Verse 18 says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength and he will make my feet like hind's feet and he will make me to walk upon my high places. Yeah. Hallelujah. See, Habakkuk understood the power of the joy strategy. He was not waiting to begin walking in joy when everything started going well, right? Even though the fig tree didn't blossom yet, even though the fruit wasn't in the vines yet, even though he didn't see olives yet, even though he didn't see any meat in the fields yet, even though the flock was cut off from the field and no herds were in the stalls yet, he said, yet I will praise the Lord. I will joy in the joy of my salvation. He made a choice to rejoice. 
This Hebrew word for joy in this verse is gil. It's, 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 it, in the Strong's Dictionary, it says it means to joy, rejoice, be glad, be joyful. How could he do this when everything was going so bad for his whole nation? The very thing he was seeking God for, he didn't see the result. But he knew the key was to the joy strategy. The joy of the Lord is my strength. I can tap into this force of cold joy and change my situation. What does the New Testament say? For the joy that was set before him, Jesus went toward the cross. He endured the shame. He had a joy strategy that was set before him, and it enabled him to be strong no matter what the devil threw at him. Amen? Hallelujah. This word gil contains the suggestion of dancing for joy or leaping for joy. And since the verb originally meant to spin around with intense emotions, oh, this, this guy, Habakkuk, would feel really at home at Covenant Church. Because we don't mind if you, if you get up and shout. We don't mind if you get up and spin around and dance in the Lord. In fact, we encourage it because we know that the joy of the Lord is your strength, and there's going to be some reaction when that joy kicks in. And it's okay, hallelujah. They can do it everywhere in the world. They can get all excited at the football games, but when it comes to church, they want to put on a sad face. With, if anybody should be joyful and happy on the earth, it's the church of the living God, amen? Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. The, uh, this whole concept of this joy, when he says, yet I will rejoice. I will join the God of my salvation. He knew who he was serving, amen? It lays to rest the notion that biblical concept of joy that it's only quiet and inner sense of well-being. Nah, it's bigger than that. You can be quiet and be joyful, it's true. You don't have to always be screaming and swinging from the chandeliers. We do have chandeliers in this house. It's in the foyer, in case you don't know. But... Uh, <laughs> But it is, you, the joy of the Lord is your strength. You can be joyful and peaceful, but that's, that's an inner strength that comes from knowing God and knowing that his plan will come to pass. Amen? Amen. See, God dances for joy over Jerusalem and because of his people. We know that from Isaiah and Zephaniah. He says, I will rejoice over you with joy. I will dance over you with joy. And the righteous Messiah, the Bible tells us, will uh, rejoice in God's salvation and, uh, excuse me, I got an, uh, an email, a text. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. The righteous Messiah shall rejoice in God's salvation with an intensity that the psalmist cannot find words to describe. We see that in Psalms 21 and so many of the psalms. He just pours out what's in his heart, amen? Including Psalm 149, it's a more familiar when it says that God re God's redeemed citizens are joyful, Within their king, they praise him with dances, with instruments, and with singing. Amen? Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a shout again. Amen. See, so although everything is wrong in Habakkuk's external world, internally, he's leaping for joy over his fellowship with his God and the promise that he has. See, he said, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will join the God of my salvation. He was calling those things that be not as though they were. Hallelujah. He declared, God is my strength. He will make my feet like hinds feet. He will make me to walk on high places. Hallelujah. He's ready to go up to the high places. Let's turn back to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. We're still going through this chapter. It's going to finish it today. Philippians chapter 3. See, Paul makes a shift in these next two verses to give the believers in Philippi a different example. He was reminding them about those that walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. And this was a warning to stay away from these bad examples. Philippians chapter 3, verse 18 and 19 says, For as many walk of them whom I've told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, those whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. It's a serious statement. Paul gets tough with these people who live to appease their fleshly appetites, and he wanted to open up the church's eyes to this. Point number three, hanging out with the wrong crowd will stunt your spiritual growth 
and stifle your joy. Hanging out with the wrong crowd will stunt your spiritual growth and stifle your joy. Hallelujah. See, he calls these people enemies of the cross, those who believe so strongly in their own greatness that they become slaves to pride. That's what's happening. See, those horrible people must be so concerned with earthly things uh, that when, even when you're in worship and in church, your mind's wandering, you're not even thinking about God. Or maybe you're just consumed with work, thinking about what you have to do at work when you leave here, even though you're only here for two hours on a Sunday. You're thinking about what you got to do when you leave, and you're not focusing 100% on God, and you're taking advantage of this wonderful opportunity. These are the people that he was talking about that were enemies of the cross. That was their pattern. I'm not saying that that hap doesn't happen to all of us from time to time, but if it's your pattern to just show up just so you look good, because there's a lot of churches that are filled with people just that way. They just show up because that's, that's the connecting place. That's the place where I get jobs. That's the place where I get clients or customers. And they have the wrong motive even for coming to church. And they live a lie. And we don't want to get caught in that trap. Amen. Amen. See, they're busy planning the next party, so they're not, they don't have even time for prayer. So we, this is the people that he was warning of them about. You know, there's, they have those people all over the place. He said, don't let them be your example. Paul says they're headed for destruction because all they can think about is this life here on earth. And it was a strong warning for all of us to remember to keep an eternal focus. Amen? Amen. Let's read the last two verses of our chapter and the last scriptures for this text, for this teaching today. Verse 20 and 21 of Philippians chapter 3. It says, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, for who who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working thereby, whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Praise the Lord. So he, he, had a, 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 he wanted to show them, remind them that they have a heavenly home. This world is not our own. You know, I've heard, often heard it said that aging is a reminder that this is not our home. And I have to think about that every now and then when I look in the mirror right now. Uh, but uh, our conversation, when he says this word conversation in verse 20, it actually means citizenship. And our Savior is in heaven preparing a place for us. That's what he told us in John chapter 14. So our ultimate destination is to be with him. This world has got a lot going on and we're supposed to be faithful to him while we're here. We're supposed to be being examples while we're here. We're supposed to be sharing the gospel to others while we're here to, so that we can bring more people to heaven so we can capture them, uh, take them out of the hand of the enemy. We should be a light in this dark place. Amen. We have a responsibility to let the joy of the Lord flow through us to walk in joy so that people say, hi, what you so happy about with all this craziness going on? I'm telling you why. I don't care what's going on. I know Jesus is coming back for me. Amen. Amen. See, as a believer, we will never be completely at peace with the world because we do not belong here. When Jesus comes for his people, they will people will discover that our ultimate place and our purpose is our heavenly citizenship. citizenship. We we are citizens of heaven right now. And when, we when he returns, we're going to see him face to face. Point number four, when you know Jesus, what he has done for you, and what he will do for you when he returns, it will overwhelm you with joy today. Hallelujah. I think I added that word today later after I sent this to the team. He will overwhelm you with joy. Hallelujah. Today, right now, on June the 2nd, 2024, and any day that might be that you're listening to this, years from now or days from now, God wants to overwhelm you with his joy, and you get that by meditating on what he's already done, what he's going to do when he comes back, and how we're going to live with him for eternity. Now, if that doesn't put a smile on your face, I don't know what will. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is a scriptural, it, you know, it's so scriptural to look for Jesus. A lot of people call it escapist theology. I'm just looking, trying to escape. No, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do while I'm here, but I'm ready to get out of here because nobody wants to be here when the rap, when the, after the rapture, when the great tribulation is going on. If you think the world is bad now, just what? 
watch and see what's going to happen when the church is out of here. We're the restraining force. We're the one that keeps things kind of halfway livable. But when we're out, watch out. You don't want to be here when Jesus returns for his church and gets us all out of here. So it's scriptural to look for the rapture or the coming of the Lord in the air for the saints to take place at any time. Now, I'm not talking about the second coming. The rapture and the second coming are two events separated by at least seven years. There are not two phases or two stages of one coming, but two distinct comings. One's coming in the air, not to the earth, before the tribulation, and the other is coming to the earth immediately after the tribulation. Amen. When he comes before the tribulation, he, that's when he captures the saints that are dead in Christ, like your mama. They're going to rise, amen, and we're going to rise to be together with them in the air, amen. and forever we're going to be with them. Whether we'll be there in heaven or the new, new earth, we're going to be there with him for eternity. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the second time that we're talking about when the, the coming of Christ, which sometimes people get confused, that's when Jesus returns to the earth with the saints Amen. that have been with him in, in uh, heaven for that seven-year marriage supper of the Lamb. That's what the Word teaches. Amen? We need to know what belongs to us as a believer and get excited about the great future that God has for each one of us. No matter, yes, give the Lord a great praise in this house. Are you looking for Jesus? Yes. I'm telling you what, he's coming for those that look for him. Yes. And he says, when I come back to the earth, will I find faith? Yes. Faith, is, we're going to need that element called faith. Faith is what gets you born again. Faith is what's going to get you up when he comes back. And faith is going to bring you up to his throne forever. Amen. And we've all been given the measure of faith. But when we activate that measure of faith by believing on Jesus with our heart and confessing him with our mouth, we are born again, and all of a sudden, we are part of God's heavenly family. We are citizens of heaven right now on this earth, amen? And we have been equipped by God with supernatural power and anointing and authority to live as overcomers in this life. So it's our responsibility to find out who you are, find out who we are in Christ, and walk it out and stand our ground. And don't let the enemy take anything that belongs to you. You know, many times people get discouraged because when the enemy attacks, they just lay down and faint. But God, we have to reckon you figure, some people think with well, just the fact that he attacks, something must be wrong. What, what's wrong with them? God, look how they're getting attacked, that they must be doing something wrong. No, sometimes that may be true, but most of the time I found out that the devil's there illegally. He trespasses. He's a liar. He's a cheat. He doesn't follow the rules. That's why it's important for you to know your rules Know what belongs to you and take your stand and rebuke him and put him in his place in the name of Jesus. Amen. Give the Lord a shout in the house this morning. Hallelujah. You know, being born again is so easy. It's as easy as A, B, C. You just admit that you need a Savior. That's A. I'm telling you this because I believe that God is going to guide you. And I've said this before. But this is something good principle for you to remember because God's going to guide you to people that don't know him. Not everybody that, that's going to get born again is going to get born again in a church. I didn't get born again in a church. I got born again watching television. And there are a lot of people that get born again one-on-one -on -one with their families. Or you pray with, I think, uh, some people pray with their children at their, at their knee, maybe when they're praying at night. And they, they, that's the moment. And they seize that moment. But it's simple as ABC. First, you admit you need a Savior. Secondly, B, believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead. Yeah. If you believe that, then you confess that C. Confess him with your mouth. Confess him as Lord of your life. Yeah. That's a, God made it simple so that anybody can do it. And it belongs to the whole world. It's the whosoever shall believe in him, the word tells us, will not perish but have everlasting life. Because he came not to condemn the world, but that through him the whole world might be saved. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Father, we're so thankful for your word this morning. Lord, I'm thankful that we can have, we can hear truth, truth that will ignite our hearts and fill us with your praise and fill us with wisdom and direction to walk out what you've called us to do. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your power that's present in this room to touch people, to heal people, to deliver them, to save them. 
Lord, I thank you for your presence that is here even right now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hello, Jesse here. I know you've been blessed today and you don't want to miss any of our upcoming videos. That's why you need to like this video, subscribe to our channel, and hit the notification bell. That notification bell lets you know when we post new videos. So like, subscribe, and hit the bell. See you next time. This media is copyrighted by Jesse Duplantis Ministries for the private use of our audience. Any other use of this media or of any pictures or accounts without Jesse Duplantis Ministries' consent is strictly prohibited.